Before we get into today's video, I do wanna let you guys know that this video is for entertainment purposes only. Please remember to be kind to everybody everywhere in your everyday life, in your home, in the grocery store, and especially in the comment section down below. Please do not show hate to anybody, anywhere. Good morning, my lovelies, my beauties, my friends. My name is Christina and welcome to my channel. If you're new here, thank you so much for clicking on this video. I really hope that you will subscribe, stick around, take a chance and hearing some things that I have to say. And if you are a returning subscriber, y'all already know. <sighs> Y'all are my babies. So good morning, good morning, good morning. How is everybody doing today? I hope you all are having an amazing day. I hope you all had a wonderful Mother's Day. Shout out to all my moms out there, yay. You guys are all wonderful. Shout out to everybody who had a hard Mother's Day. I know Mother's Day is not as pleasant for everybody. Some people's mothers have passed on or they haven't had a mother or maybe you know some people just have really wanted to be a mother and have not been able to be a mother and that day is hard for them as well. Love you guys, big hug, shout out to all you guys as well. My Mother's Day was wonderful. I got to spend it with my family in a condo on the beach. Very nice, very relaxing, lots of good food, lots of hugs and love and it was just great so in today's video this video let me tell you guys I'm filming this my second time filming this okay I filmed the whole entire thing this this video has so many twists and turns like I need some help okay I need somebody to sit down and, and give me a one-on-one -on -one after after researching this like I filmed the whole entire thing and then whenever I was going to edit it and I was looking up photos I found a whole nother article that kind of made me go oh, I need to add that I thought about doing a voiceover but I was like no I got to give you guys a full effect so buckle up and get ready for this This is a wild one okay this is a wild ride okay you ready all right let's start at the beginning Little Caitlin Marie Coleman was born in August of 1994. She was a 90s baby. Shout out to my 90s babies out there. She lived with her mother, Angela, and her father, John. Her father, John, worked at a factory in their local town, and her she had one big sister, so it was just her parents and her big sister. Now, the town that they lived in was, like so many of these stories, believe it or not, a very small town. Only 1,500 people in the whole entire town, okay? So this was considered to be like a very safe town. Everybody knows everybody. The only small amount of police, you know, everybody knows the police. Everybody knows the, probably got one bank, two banks, whatever. Very, very small town. Low crime rate. At this time, this is taking place in 2005. There had not been a documented murder or a murder at all in over 25 years, okay? So this was a very chill, laid back, friendly, 1,500 people at max town that she was growing up in. Now the town was Crothersville, Indiana, and Caitlin, who went by Katie, was in fourth grade at her elementary school. Now Katie was described as very outgoing. Uh, her whole entire family was very much involved in their church, and Katie did like extra activities at the church. She went a few extra days other than just on Sunday, and she had a lot of friends. She was considered to be a popular little girl and very friendly, big smile, loved to play. When Everything changed for Katie, her family, and the whole entire town of Crothersville was on January 25th of 2005, and it was a Tuesday. The Tuesday started off like every other Tuesday morning. Katie gets up, her mom is in the kitchen cooking a hot breakfast, you know, bacon, eggs, biscuits, the whole nine yards. Her dad is up, sitting at the table, drinking his coffee, getting ready to go work at the factory. Her sister gets up. Katie sits down at the kitchen table. She eats breakfast with her big sister and her dad, and then she hops in the truck with her dad to go to school. Now her dad would take her to school every single morning and drop her off and in the afternoons when she got out of school around 2 45 she would ride home with a friend's mom. Now the friend's mom would take a couple of the kids home you know it was like a little carpooling thing and on this Tuesday Katie got dropped off after school at about 3 o'clock p.m. When Katie walked inside she noticed that her mom was kind of frantic this day and, and very frazzled. She was cooking dinner, she's throwing her apron around like she's trying to get dinner 
in a hurried up and cook before her husband gets home. And Katie saw that her mom was overwhelmed and they needed toilet paper. So Katie asked her mom if she could give her the money for the toilet paper and Katie would walk to the Dollar General that was a block and a half away like she had done many times before and get the toilet paper for the house. Katie's mom gave her $2 to go get the toilet paper and Katie put on her jacket. So on this day, little 10 year old Katie had on a red shirt, black pants, black shoes, and a blue puffy jacket because it was cold on this January evening in 2005. Katie walks out of her house and in order to get to the Dollar General, she just kind of like walked across the street where there was this big apartment complex. Now in the apartment complex was a lot of friends that she went to school with as well, people that she knew. So she would just walk through this apartment complex and on the other street was there the Dollar General. Katie walked into the Dollar General. She walked down the aisle. She picked out a pack of toilet paper. She goes up to the front to pay for it. And the cashier who knew Katie realized that Katie did not have enough money. She was a few cents short of what she needed to pay for the toilet paper. The cashier reached in her pocket, grabbed the rest of the change, paid for it for Katie. Katie waved, said thank you. She told her she'd see her later. Katie walked next door to the bank walks into the bank, walks up to the desk, and asks for a lollipop. She gets a lollipop from there, she leaves the bank, and from there, things get fuzzy. Okay, so hold that thought. Later that evening, a little while after that, Katie's mom is looking around the house and realizes that she's not back yet. Okay, like, where is she? I'm cooking, dinner's almost ready, where is she? And she's thinking, okay, Katie must have just got up with some of her friends in that apartment complex, probably just started playing, kicking a ball around, whatever, not paying attention and has lost track of time. She kind of just tells herself that and lets a little bit of time go by. A little bit more time goes by. The sun starts to set, starts to get dark, and Katie's mom starts getting concerned. She starts getting concerned. She starts calling the neighbors, calling people that would know where Katie is. Nobody says that they have seen her other than the lady at the Dollar General, you know, and then the ladies at the bank. Nobody else had really seen her. She did not stop and play with any friends. Around this time, Katie's father, John, gets home and they're both pretty frantic now. Around 8 p.m. when Angela nor John could find Katie, this is when they call the police. Now, this is almost five hours after she left the house, okay? So it's, this is a long time. Anything could happen in five hours. But, you know, during this time, Katie's mom started thinking all kinds of things. She thought, okay, well, she may have ran to Walmart with one of her friends, one of the parents or whatever, which to me, don't take my kid nowhere without asking me. I don't care who you are, like, no offense or anything. Even my mother-in-law, my grandparents, don't come and get my kid and take my kid anywhere <laughs> if I haven't said yes, I don't care. You know what I mean? So, and... My family wouldn't do that anyways, but that was what she was thinking in her mind. When she found out that she was not with any of these people and it was eight o'clock at night, almost five hours later, this is when the police got involved. The police come out, they take a report, they start searching, they've got the dogs looking at this point. A few hours later, a big chunk of the community starts getting involved looking for Katie. Now you've got hundreds of people, which is a big chunk of that community when there's only 1500 people out looking for Katie, walking, speaking, knocking on doors. Not long after this, one of Katie's friends comes up to the police and Katie's parents and said, I did see Katie as a matter of fact. After she left the Dollar General, she came by our house and said that our dog had got hit by the train and was dead over there by the train tracks. So Katie had walked up there, knocked on the door, told them that their dog was dead, then showed them where the dog was, and then she walked off, and then nobody saw her from there. The police and the family, they go over to the train tracks, and the police put the dogs, you know, on the train tracks to try to pick up on Katie's scent. They found Katie's scent, but then they lost it, and then it was just gone. So, like, as a mother, I don't know, like, would that make me feel better or not, right? Like, you, she, yeah, okay, she came to your house, but then she disappeared again. It's almost like they got a glimmer of hope, and then again, it was gone. The next day, a witness came forward and said that they had seen Katie riding in a truck, a white Ford F-150 in the passenger side of the truck 
with a man that had kind of a long, slim face. He was tall. You know, he was had very pale skin, dark hair, really, really skinny. And that Katie did not seem like she was upset. She was just riding in the passenger seat of this truck. So at this point, they put out a sketch for this guy. And this was the sketch right here. And an Amber Alert was set out. Now, this is two days later at this point when the Amber Alert finally goes out. Now, in this town... The Amber Alert feature had been used over 20 times since Amber Alert became a thing. And every single time in this town that Amber Alert was activated, the child was found and brought back home. So that did give the parents some hope that she would be found at this point. After the Amber Alert was activated, the parents released a statement basically just begging for Katie's return. They were saying like, Please just bring our baby girl back. Just drop her off at a store. Drop her off here. You know, you won't be in trouble. We're not mad at you. Just bring her back unharmed. And you guys, like, this is like a mother's worst nightmare. A father's worst nightmare. A parent's worst nightmare. A loved one's. Anybody's. Okay? Like, but especially as a, as a parent. Like, where you are just begging to the camera. Like, I don't care who did it. Just bring my baby back alive and safe. Right? You're like, in that moment, you don't care. Just please bring my baby back. They were just begging, begging the camera. On the fifth day, which was on January 30th, 2005, Katie's family got the worst news ever. Her body was found floating in a snowy lake about 15 to 19 miles from her house. They said that she was completely submerged in the water. Her hands were tied behind her back and it was very obvious that she had been S.A. assaulted and then murdered. Later, an autopsy was done and the cause of death was drowning. So that right there told the investigators that whoever took her then assaulted her in that way, tied her hands behind her back and put her in that river like that alive. And she drowned like, oh, I just cannot imagine you guys like devastating. The whole entire town was shook. Everybody in the town. I mean, you got to imagine these people, they're looking at each other. Did you do this? You know, as a mom too, you're probably thinking like every person that gave you the weirdest look, you know, you're thinking like, man, I saw that guy at Home Depot that day and man, he was looking at Katie a little bit too long. Like you start thinking all kinds of, stuff. oh yeah, Roger's son, like he, that, 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 that teenage son of his, he's weird. You know, he could, you know, like it just is causing all of this talk and paranoia in their town and oh my gosh. And the parents, it was bad. Nobody could really figure out what kind of monster in their town would do this to little Katie. Soon after it's released to the public that her body is found, a man named Charles, AKA Chucky Hickman comes forward. He confessed that him and one of his friends abducted Katie. He said that Katie had seen an illegal drug deal going on, that something to do with like a meth lab and that she had seen an exchange of substances and that they took her, they abducted her, they took her to the lake and they tied her hands behind her back and they were just going to scare her into not saying anything and she fell into the lake and then she drowned and they got scared and they left her. And the story made sense to the investigators. And so they arrested Charles. As word got out, like rumors started going around about Charles or Chucky that he was considered like very strange or weird. Different people in the community said that they saw him standing in his front yard, like staring into the sky, talking to himself and just, I mean, if he was doing meth, he's probably doing all kinds of stuff. Like he was talking to somebody. It may have been 15 invisible people, but if he was on that mess, y'all ever seen intervention? Okay. He was talking to somebody. Y'all just didn't see them. Anyways, so that is what people started talking about. Now the cops, they go to question his friend and hopefully arrest his friend, Timothy. Charles said that it was him and his 22 year old friend, Timothy, that did this. When they questioned Timothy, Timothy had no idea what, or he said he had no idea what Charles was talking about. He hadn't provided an alibi of where he was the night that Katie went missing. And so now the cops are scratching their head and they go back to Charles and they ask him again. When they ask him again, he tells the story, but he tells it a little bit differently this time. The more that they questioned him, the more that they realized that they didn't think he was telling the truth at all. To some people, he kind of looks like the sketch, but... He doesn't drive a white Ford F-150. He did not match any of the DNA that was found on Katie and DNA was found on her. And the guy that he said he did it with had an alibi and 
was not there and his story kept changing. So now the police are starting to believe like we need to keep investigating this because we don't think he's our guy. Now at the crime scene where Katie's body was found, where they got some DNA actually off of her, they actually found a cigarette butt out there. The cigarette butt had DNA on it as well. While it was going through the database, searching, 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 a match came up for a man named Anthony Stockman, who goes by Tony, an absolute hit for his DNA. When the police go to where Tony lives, Tony says, yeah, my mother lives in Crothersville. I was visiting my mother on that day, but I've never seen Katie. I don't know who this girl is. I'm so sorry for your troubles. I hate to hear that, but I have no idea who she is. I was visiting my mom and that is it. The cops asked Tony, do you mind if we search your truck? He had a white Ford F-150. Tony said, sure, of course. So he voluntarily just let them search his truck. Like it's nothing, like sure. When they searched his truck, they did not find anything. No hair follicles that matched Katie's, no DNA or anything like that. The cops then asked Tony if he would take a lie detector test and he said yes. They take him down and he completely passes the lie detector test. Now, at this point the cops are really stumped but they have this man's DNA on this cigarette butt and now on her body, okay? Then as they continued to search her body, they found red like pieces of a rug that was also found in Tony's mom's house. Now I want you guys to know, the other guy, Charles or Chucky, the one that admitted to doing it, but they don't, they don't believe it. He actually has a record or had assaulted a little girl before. Okay, so he had a record of that. This guy, Tony, had two misdemeanors, one for battery and one for something else, like un drinking under the age when he was a kid. Nothing big, no, no big charges or anything like that. But they had his DNA match, so they ended up arresting him. This is when things start taking another strange turn, okay? They arrest Tony and not long after that, he admitted to everything and he takes a plea deal, okay? He takes a plea deal to in order to avoid the death penalty and they give him life without the possibility of parole plus 30 years for the essay. So he gets the life for the kidnapping and the murder and then he gets the 30 years for the actual molestation part of it, okay? Now this is how I heard about this story. Here's another twist and turn to this story, okay? This is how I heard about it. On Facebook, I was scrolling through and I saw this picture right here of this tattoo. Do you see this tattoo? On the forehead, it says Katie's Revenge. So I saw this and it was an article about a man who had been sent to prison for kidnapping, assaulting, and murdering a little girl. And it said that when he got to prison, somebody did this to him. And I thought, okay, you know, we've talked about prison over here. Let me read this and see if this is real. I researched it and this is his story. So what happened was after he got sent, sentenced to prison, not long after that, I want to say about a year after he had been in prison. I mean, he hadn't been in prison long, honey. He hadn't even got his feet wet up in there, okay? He is still probably in the intake, something like that. Katie's, little Katie's cousin, Jared, got sentenced to prison as well. And they just happened to put him and Tony in the same wing together. Jared sneaks into Tony's cell in the middle of the night and shuts the door behind him. So they must have had actual cells and not open pods. Shuts the door behind him, jumps on him. Who knows what all happened, physical, you know, whatever. And he holds him down and he says, you've got one of two choices. I'm either going to kill you right here, right now for what you did to Katie, or you're going to get a tattoo on your head. And as terrified as Tony was, he said he would take the tattoo. Probably didn't know what the tattoo was. Holy moly. He holds him down and he tattoos Katie's revenge on his forehead. And you can see how it is, it's all red here. And you gotta give the guy props because he did the straightest lines when he did Katie. Like he made it big, large, and in charge. Now, any of you guys that's been in prison, you know you're not allowed to get tattoos. Yes, prison tattoos are a big thing, but if they see you with a fresh tattoo or if you get caught giving one, you will get in big trouble in prison. They do it all the time anyway, especially if you got life. I mean, like, what do you got to lose? What are they gonna do, you know? put you in prison. I mean, you're never getting out anyways. Nevertheless, this tattoo is kind of hard for him to hide, right? So when he comes out of the cell the next morning with his forehead all bright and red and hurt from being held down and getting a tattoo, the correctional officers see him. They start questioning him. It goes under investigation, okay? It goes under investigation. Now, it is said that that guy, Jared, that was her cousin, got charged and given seven more years in prison for that tattoo. Seven years? 
I got a lot that I want to say that I said in the other video, but I found something else, another twist and turn. So I got to hold it for now. I got to hold it back. It's coming though. So you guys stick with me. Okay. He got sentenced for seven years for that. The correctional officers that wrote up the report and took this picture that you guys seen, they took that picture and they shared it with somebody. Somehow, some way it got released to the public. That's how we get to see it. That's how it's come out here. Those two correctional officers were fired from their job for that. Okay. Now this was where about a right about this, where the story ended for me before, but when I was researching it, I found a whole article that said free Tony stock stockman. And it was written by him. I guess he sent it to a family member. And I will leave it linked down below if you guys want to read it. It is very long. And in it, he's talking about how he's innocent, okay? He is innocent about the whole thing. He thinks he was set up. He thinks that the DNA match never really happened, that the police just said that. He said that he did take a plea, plea deal. He said because he was, let's just say, convinced to take the plea deal. Now, we know that happens, okay? Especially if you ain't got no money and you're, you know, class, you know, it's, it's a class thing. In my personal opinion, he said that he was basically convinced. Now he said that he was married at the time and his wife stuck by him for a long time. And then she got scared. Something happened and he believed that she became convinced. And then she testified against him in court. So that was like a twist and turn. It's like the other video that I did, I was like, well, is the tattoo um, maybe justified, <laughs> right? Because you got to be in prison for the rest of your life for that on there. And everywhere you go, people are going to know exactly what you did, okay? Because there's no hiding that, right? But if he didn't do it, okay, if he didn't. Now, the, the evidence, the DNA evidence says that it matches, okay? I don't really see how they could just make up DNA evidence. Not say that they don't. Not saying you know, whatever, but it is interesting that the other guy that admitted to it actually had that charge before, had a whole story and got off scot-free. This guy never had any kind of charges like that, you know, passed a lie detector test. Nothing was found in his truck, but the DNA evidence matches. Now, another twist and turn to this, which I thought was so flip-flopping. It was like, I cannot make up my mind about this story. I think he did it. I think it's possible he didn't. I think he did. I think it's possible he didn't. He filed for an appeal. Okay. I'll leave that linked down below as well. In the appeal, he states all of the reasons why he thinks he should get another trial. This, like the second reason is that his father had died six months prior to the incident with Katie and that he had had a long bout with cancer and that his dad died like this horrible, you know, c cancer is horrible. You know, it is, it, it's, it's devastating to watch somebody that you love be eaten away by such a, a terrible, terrible thing. It is it, it, for anybody. So I, I feel for him if that is true. However, he said that it messed with his mental health so much. That's why he did it. Okay. Then he gives other reasons why he should have an appeal like his four children and, you know, all of these other reasons why he should get an appeal. Now they denied it, but I'm going, if you didn't do it, why are you saying that you did do it and you did it because of your father? Okay. So, or maybe he has to do that. I, I don't know. It's, there's so many twists and turns. I would love for you guys to tell me what you think. Help me out here. Do you think he did it or do you think he didn't do it? Now, one more thing. The thing that makes me think he probably did it, in my opinion, is because I do know that when you get in prison for life, we've talked about this a million times on this channel, you start coming up with stories, okay? Oh, I didn't really do it, you know? I mean, y'all know Chris Watts is not, I, I don't know what he's saying, but it, it's a whole hot mess, right? We know the Gabriel... Fernandez case, his mom is in prison for life and she's trying to get a retrial. I mean, it's just what happens. So I don't know. I am more apt to believe the DNA evidence that matches. I don't care if he, you know, just because somebody doesn't have any priors for that doesn't mean that one, he hasn't done it before and people just didn't come forward. That happens all the time. It does. Or two, it was his first time, which I doubt it was. If he snatched up a little girl and did that 
and a cigarette butt was found there. And, but then again, he, he let them search his truck and he passed a, he passed a lie detector test, which I know, you know, some people can do. Some people are good at, I don't know. Help me out here. I'm going to leave all the links down below. You guys let me know what you think. I have to know what you guys think. Okay. <laughs> As always, my loves, thank you guys so, so much for watching this video. Thank you for going through this brain twister for me. Shout out to Katie's family, everybody that loved her. Oh my gosh. So devastating. I pray that everybody has peace and that they're doing okay now. Ugh. As always, my loves, please do not forget to like this video. It's a free way that you can help your girl out. And until next time, I love you guys so, so, so very much. And I'll see y'all in the next video. Bye. Love you guys. Bye. Tell me what you think. <laughs> we are, we are dreaming in the dark. We are nothing more than dust. Search, but you stay lost. We are.